various universities, colleges. That this morning we have five speakers and chair and co-chair. So chair, we have His Excellency Professor Dr. Son Sonan, full member Royal Academy of Cambodia, senior advisor to the Royal Government of Cambodia. So please welcome Professor Dr. Son Sonan. And co-chair, may I invite Professor Sosmita Pandey, National Monument Authority, India. Please, Professor. As co-chair, sit here to the right of Professor Santana. So, on this panya, as thank you for So, have to be fair and accurate. <laughs> if so. Timekeeper has a very big responsibility because only one minute in partial he will be mm, criticized <laughs> severely. Mm. Uh, if he is partial to any speaker, then um, other speakers will punish him. So um, now we would like to invite all the speaker and uh, we will hand over the session to his Excellency Professor Dr. Son Sonang, please, Professor. I would like to respectfully inform the panelists and the audience that we have the time from now until 11.30 and the lunch is ready in the restaurant, so in this hotel itself. So we have we save the time because lunch is ready. Just go and have, <laughs> uh, especially the Theravada months, we have to have lunch before midday. Midday can be after 12. Uh, it depends on the, the moving of the sun. Uh, or sometimes if you miss the midday here, yeah, you have, oh, midday I was somewhere else. So you um, have the lunch according to that time. <laughs> so thank you so much. Yeah, so we have um, roughly about two hours. Uh, we'll hand over the floor to Professor Dr. Son Tomnan, please. Council for Cultural 
relation. However, the morning session is on Buddhism and uh, in Southeast Asia. I have a great pleasure to chair this session and I would like to introduce uh, my co-chair, uh, Professor Susbida Bade, Chairman of National Museum of Authority of India. And then I would like to introduce uh, <coughs> Uh, our speaker um, and uh, first of all is uh, most venerable Dr. Uh, Sakya Kongsa uh, from uh, the president of World uh, Buddhist University in Thailand and then uh, Dr. Maes you Dr. Mahesh, yeah. uh, Kumar <coughs> Saran, a former university professor and head of the faculty department of ancient India and uh, Asian Sarai uh, uh, of India. And then uh, Dr. <coughs> Lau Asif. Yeah. Is the director of uh, Nalanda Buddhist College of Indonesia, and then uh, Professor B. Kiran, yeah. the senior vice president of Buddhist uh, Kriti Prachar Sangha Bangladesh. So uh, we uh, each presenter we have. Uh, well, and for the 15 minutes for presentation, 15 minutes presentation, and we and before the <coughs> closing of the presentation, we will have a discussion. So uh, for the presentation, each speaker have uh, 15 minutes for uh, presentation. Yeah, and uh, I would like to ask my uh, co-chair if you wish to address something, please. At the outset, I would like to thank CSR Buddhist University, Indian University and ICCR for having given me the opportunity to interact with everybody here. And uh, since the time is limited, so I would uh, say that we will directly go on to the paper. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. This is not a big one, but I'm going to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. เอ่อมันเนี่ยแต่บทงานบทความนี้ให้มันเปิดบ้านต่อต่อปีนี้ที่เราเลือกสัญญาตามสอบไปที่ให้ได้ดูมาสอบเอ่อบ้านในการเป
and especially Professor Sarau has already set a very good tone with a very sharp and elaborated, very precise keynote that what we are seeing, Buddhism, or what we are seeing, the extension of Indian cultures in Southeast Asia, it is totally different from the whole idea of the modern colonizations, what we used to uh, more or less familiar with. In many cases, we are, we are still sometimes haunted by this colonial idea here and there, time to time. But the whole idea of Indianizations, not as a colonization, and as well as Buddhismization, I guess, is a very different way of sharing the civilization, cultures, and prosperity, especially aiming directly to the local community. This is, in a modern sense, we might, we might call it globalizations. But not in a sense as modern world, as globalizations, the idea is globalized, but whereas the Buddhism and the culture civilization here is localized. So what we see as a Southeast Asia is a very rich um, culture, language, civilizations, you know, they have a different form from Indus Valley, where we all originated from. But talking about this sharp presentation, I'm going to give you a very brief account, a kind of a very rethinking on this whole issue of history of Buddhism in Southeast Asia. As I am another historian, or uh, archaeologist, or uh, any type of the expertise on, this, on that field, being an anthropologist, a trained anthropologist myself, I have a very different look at the subject. Uh, in fact, some of the ideas on archaeology, some of the ideas on history as an anthropologist, I have to say that I can't deny that, and I have to use a lot on that point. But I have a different way of seeing all those things. So in this very 15 minutes of my presentation, which I understand that the paper, the full paper, is already published in the book, which was already released this morning. I don't know when we'll get that, but you can go when you get that paper. But I'm going to be very brief within this limited time on the two points. The one point is the Subordinate itself which is a very debatable, which is a very nationality kind of movement ideas going on later on. And the second is a very sort of my own theory. I just want to throw the theory for the among the scholars, whether it is possible or not. I'm not going to say that this is a sound theory or not, but this is a kind of a bold theory of my own to show that why Buddhism in Southeast Asia is so strong, it is so relevant, to this area, especially what we call Southeast Asia. And of course, when we talk about uh, so Southeast Asia, the word is very new. It was used only after the Second World War. And it was first used by, I think, the Austrian. Before that, we didn't have this word Southeast Asia, but we are now so take for granted this with word. But actually, the ancient word will be the Suvarna Bhumi, Suvarna Bhumi as a Pali, Suvarna Bhumi as a Sanskrit, as well as there's some other things. For example, in the text we have a Suvarna Deepa, which emphasizes something on the archipelago, with all the islands, you see, all the Indonesias and, and so and so. So that's why when we say that Suvarna Bhumi, it is not only the word Suvarna Bhumi itself, but it has a many different words, are the Suvarna Kuta, Suvarna Pura, or the Deepa Tantra, so it's a Deepantara, so, so, so many other words it is in the text. But the whole idea is, what does it really indicating to? Where is it indicating to? It indicates mostly, what we say is that uh, east, uh, east of India and south of China, this whole piece of land here. And this is the, what we call a uh, Suvarna Bhumi. On one note, I have to put that here again that when we say Suvarna Bhumi, it is not only the name of the place or region, 
I am looking at a very different point. Why we call Suvarna Bhumi? We call Suvarna Bhumi because it is the place where most of the very brave merchant traders from India and from other places come in this area. This is a tropical area, very enriched area. They come and dig their gold or do the trade. Same as when we say stay in America, we have a San Francisco, we have a Golden Gate. When I was teaching there, I was asking that why this is Golden Gate? I see the red, uh, this is a red bridge. I didn't see any Golden Gate. Then they told me the story that they got Golden Gate because most of the Chinese and Japanese, they pass through that sort of a gate and then go to the San Jose and San, uh, Santa Clara area to dig uh, their gold. And same as these days in the labor market, we go to the Arab or Middle East to dig the gold. Basically, the Suwar Bhumi, what I see is that it has a more meaning in a sense that this is the very enriched place where every people, every merchant traders come and do the trade. So that's why this is called Suwar Bhumi. This is the land of gold, land of opportunity, where people from every nook and corner come and uh, do their business. But when we talk about the Suvarna Bhumi itself, so there are very nationalistic debates going on. Sometimes it says that Cambodia says that they have just found a new place, Kampong Sepu, which is saying that this is the heart of Suvarna Bhumi. Whereas Indonesia says that these are, they are the Suvarna Bhumi. Same as Myanmar also says that, as uh, Professor Ralph says that, they, they also claim that this is a Suvarna Bhumi from the Tapas of Bahaluka who went there. In, 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 in to India from the time of the Buddha. Thailand, of course, also boldly claimed that uh, Nakhon Patom and uh, Nakhon Chai Si, all those areas is a sword of Bhumi. And what about Vietnam? Vietnam is still not silent. Vietnam also says that actually the word Funan, the kingdom of Funan at the time, is the word Suwarna of Bhumi itself, because in Chinese it means that the golden land. So you see. So in that kind of a, you know, this kind of a debate, it's a very politicized debate. I don't want to go in there, but this is a, some kind of a thing. Every, this area, everyone is talking about. But in terms of Buddhist texts, it is very rich. Even in Jataka, for example, Mahajanaka, in the Mahanidesa, Milinda Panna, Vimana Vatu, Sadhamma Pachaujika, Deepa Vamsa, Mahavamsa, Dityavada, everywhere there is a mention of Suvarna Bhumi. And everywhere, in mostly they point to this area called uh, Suvarna Bhumi. It's very, 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 uh, uh, very, very convincing. And very oddly, I found one of the illustration, illustrated Nepalese manuscript, all the way on the Nepal. They have the, some kind of entitled pictures there. Suvarna Pure Sri Vijaya Pure Lokanatha. All the images of Lokanatha, the Buddha, in Sri Vijaya Pura, in Suvarna Pura. So it means that all the way in the Himalayan mountain, they knew where the Suvarna Bhumi is. Because if you just made the Suvarna Bhumi someone else, but three visions you make it very clear that this is somewhere in this area. <laughs> so these are the kind of a location of the Suvarna Bhumi. And in that sense, from the time that in the, in the beginning of our history, we see that there's a lot of uh, small kingdoms spreading all around here. So this is how we have been taking, uh, we have been receiving all the Buddhism and uh, in this Southeast Asia. Especially if you look at the, all the architectures, Ramanan in Indonesia is one of the greatest Hindu temple, and as well as in Angkor Wat here, which is the Nagara, uh, Borobudur, Paramabuddha, and even in the Vietnam. So you have all those places where Buddhism become a more or less reshifted from India to all these services. In Southeast Asia, we, what we can see is that a very, very uh, lavish, in a sense, it is something in India, Buddhism disappeared, but up to the, from the, let's say that about 10th century onward, Buddhism has been really established, or maybe really established here in this area. Uh, we have many other concepts, like a concept of a Raja. And of course, as uh, many has mentioned earlier, the script from the Pallava and from the Brahmi is the same. So based on these ideas, you can see that we have a two sort of a theory of Buddhism 
how Buddhism came here. And mostly what I read is mostly the sort of uh, go for the theory of maritime Buddhism, which that's why I'm not so convincing. Because most of the, our historical book these days, we talk about how Buddhism came here in the Southeast Asia. Mostly, very convincing evidence are all maritime. And, uh, but what I see is that uh, maritime, for example, this is a small clip of video, you can see that uh, uh, on a new book from India, I think they, uh, they just made it very interestingly. Sea for sure, it must be from north. 
And that's why this is a route here we can see people used to travel around 100 years ago. This is, I still have some proof that people can still walk this way. I found the people who walk this way. So in that sense, uh, there is a lot of these historical uh, archaeological sites in Thailand, in everywhere, which means that it uh, looks like the all from Angkor Wat start, of the Sikhar start. So this is the one theory I'm giving, that Buddhism is very strong here because it is not only from, from the sea route, maritime route, which was developed later, but prior, prior to the sea route, the Buddhism was here because of this trade route, which I call cotton route. And then if we trace the cotton route, how do we trace? How do we trace? This is, I just simply trace based on the, of the secret style, the, the, the archaeological site. And then if you go this one, you can go into the Burma and you can go all the way to India. This is, I thought that this must be a cotton route where all the Indian traders, all Thai, the Southeast Trader used to go and then they set up a small set of community, small uh, city where along the way where they have to travel. And these, all this flourishing of Buddhism is so uh, conveniently uh, maybe taken very, very strongly because they knew the language. Because if we take up a sea from Sri Lanka, of course, I accept that because of only the textual Buddhism, only the Buddhism as a lineage, as a monk from there. The Buddhism as a civilization, I'm proposing that it must be through the cotton road on the surface. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Gaur, for your very interesting presentation, focusing on two main points on the Sobari boom and on the Southeast Asia and the new thinking of Southeast Asia. Very interesting. Uh, I think that you can see 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 that เป็นอ่าตลอดเลยอันนี้มุ่นมุ่นรอบหน้าตามโปรดบอกตอนนี้ก็เป็นการนับอ้ายตามโปรโปรโซนได้ฉะนั้นเอ่อยูเฟิร
here we are in Turk to Cambodia also and uh, the along with Hindu gods and goddesses, many images of Buddha and Buddhism, gods of Mahayan school of thought were found in Cambodia in different parts of the country. A great statue of Buddha seated on Naga has been found in the temple of Prasad Sema. The Nag and Brahmanic decorations in the images are due to the influence of Hindu artists. A terracotta representation of seated Buddha has been found at Um Wang Wan Thong, at Wat Wan Thok Nang Long. These are the places of Cambodia. A, a wooden statue of Buddha seated of Nag has been discovered also. In a stele of Wat Klan, Five Buddhas have been depicted. They are seated on the tower. On the Fufra fountain of the Buddha, seven images of Buddha sitting in Dhyan Mudra meditation have been found also. Islamist in the reign of Quran, Dhamma Chakra, the wheel of love and bronze statue of Buddha has been discovered in archaeological site. Again, from the from inscription of Asho Varavan, we find also, and he did many donations for Buddhist monks for the propagation of Buddhism in the country. Important personalities considered to be believers and exponents of Buddhism faith are as follows. They are the persons of and Cambodia. The king Yasho Varman, who founded Asrama for and then achievements of Buddhism, Buddhist people and, and general people also. Rajendra Varman II, he was the ruler of 944 to 968 AD. He also uh, made images of Tathagat. Jayavarman Sevan, he was the, um, he established Buddha Rajkar. We know about Deva Rajkar. The founder of Deva Rajkar was Jayavarman II. And the Deva Rajkar uh, narrates the invocation of Lord, uh, invocation of Lord Shiva and the, uh, and the history of his uh, family, etc. Jayavarman second, but when uh, Jayavarman seventh came to the home, he converted and he stopped uh, Dev Rajkal and he founded Buddha Rajkal where Lord Buddha was given high position. That top Ram inscription refers to the name of Pragya Paramita. Jayavarman seventh gave the name Paragya Parvita for his mother also. Jayabuddha Mahanta has been discovered from various parts of the ancient empire scattered in different parts of Cambodia. And the popularity of this cult can be imagined also from the fact that the people also contributed towards the construction of such new gigantic as smiling faces at my own, which we are compared to Lord Buddha. So all these things, the prevalence of the cult was responsible for the gigantic faces on the towers of my own, Bhante Kadai, Bhante Chamar, representing the Buddha Bodhisattva, Lokateshwar, and uh, uh, LP Briggs. He had written a book. As a Khmer Empire, it was published from Philadelphia in the year 1951. Narrate, this book narrates the mostly the religious part of the Mongolian history in which Lokeshwara, Pragya Parvita, Lord Buddha, Tathagat were mentioned everywhere 
in the, if, if we find in ancient Khmer Empire written by um, Dr. L. T. Briggs. This is in late cell about Cambodian history in which Buddhism was prevalent, Buddhism was found, people uh, reverent, Buddhism, etc. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. <coughs> Mayesh Kumar, for your very interesting presentation on Buddhism in Cambodia. My refreshing uh, history of Cambodia from Phnom uh, Chema, and Angkor Kaliya. And uh, on Dev uh, Russia, and uh, for Salman the second and uh, Buddha Raja uh, for uh, Salman the seventh. It's very interesting. And uh, my question is, you have uh, some questions? I must congratulate Mahesh Sarangi for giving a brilliant lecture on the subject because he's an authority on uh, Buddhism in Southeast Asia. And uh, I found your uh, the you have covered the entire history from the earliest time, first century CE to the later ages too, to the time of the Lola Lord too. And uh, I found it very interesting that uh, you have compared the two Devarmans. First, gave uh, uh, the Devaraj cult and the second uh, Devarman seventh are the Buddha Raj cult. I have also heard of uh, his uh, wife, the queen of Devarman seventh, that she was. She used to, she was a Buddhist, she, but she used to perform great austerities and then uh, she also introduced the uh, dramatic performances here. That is what I have heard also. And uh, uh, like you, you have uh, mentioned many, uh, the impact of uh, the Mahayana treaties also yes. over here. That is something very new, uh, that not many uh, books speak of. And uh, because you, uh, like in Java, there was a great influence, we all know that they were influenced by the uh, Pala rulers and the Dola uh, rulers who, who had their impact here. But this is uh, very useful information that uh, Cambodia was also uh, the great impact on the art, iconography, and the uh, inscriptions also. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for my Cambodian uh, participant, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, <coughs> uh, my Ashley got uh, about the uh, Buddha man. I love uh, the people who they they come here with my Funako, uh, Noma, Jela, and Goma. I got about the Buddha man speak that I jumped down. Interesting presentation, and now uh, we continue to another speaker. First, the number one, the number larger. Yeah. Uh... 
we think about how to propagate Buddhism in Indonesia. So that's what a good uh, condition in Indonesia, the policy of the Indonesia ma make a students in school must choose one religion. Yeah. In Indonesia we have some religion like the Buddhist, Islam, Christian, Catholic, Hindu, and Kombucha. So every school must choose, yeah, must choose what religion, yeah. So Nanda Buddhist school, yeah, the foundation of Nanda, think about the how to prepare young generation to become a Buddhist teacher, yeah. Uh, we Nanda produce some Buddhist teacher yeah, to teach Buddhism in school, yeah, like me, yeah, like me. Uh, I, I this. Uh, this is in Sayendra. Sayendra uh, built a Bobudu temple yeah, in 7th century, 7 and 8th century. And also this uh, Buddhist temple also in uh, Central Java, many, many Buddhist temples. Yeah, like the uh, uh, Bobudu, Sewu, yeah, and another one. Century in Sumatra, also in Java, yeah, so Jaya Kingdom is very famous for Buddhist, yeah, for Buddhism. This is uh, Nanda, yeah, uh, university, and that time maybe uh, more uh, become a Buddhist, yeah, so uh, everyone can study Buddhism in Sivijaya. Kingdom. And also in the west of Java, we have the at Batu Jaya. At Batu Jaya, west of Java, we have the also monument of the of the Buddhist, uh, Buddhist temple. Yeah, Muar Jambi, Muar Tapus, and many, uh, many uh, area in Indonesia have Buddhist temple. This is uh, that's why Buddhism sweep yeah, because the Islam go up yeah, very fastly in the 16th century and yeah, the revival at 19th, almost the 20th century. Yeah. This is the site of the revival of Buddhism in Indonesia. Only uh, three painting ceremony were in Borobudur, yeah, by Venerable Nada Mahathira, yeah. is Asin General Kita uh, started to become a monk in 1953 yeah, the first monk from Indonesia after that some become a monk and for the 
panel asin so become a sangha in Indonesia about in 1960 about 1960 in Indonesia we have some tradition Theravada tradition Mahayana tradition also Antayana tradition uh, so we can find some temple in Jakarta or Java or Sumatra, yeah. Uh, Mahayana tradition, Theravada also Tantrayana tradition. But the most often is Theravada and Mahayana. This is temple very famous in Indonesia. Yeah. Kaasan, Sari, Bebutul, Pawan, Ngawen Temple, Sewu, Pawasan. Organization right at 1956, yeah. Uh, Buddha Jayanti, like the Walubi, Maka Budi, or Buddhist organization, Kasi, and another, another one. This is also from uh, Thailand, how Buddhism uh, grow up at Indonesia, yeah. Also, this is from Mahamakut Buddhist University also. Yeah. From Dhamma Duta from Thailand. Yeah. Until now, Dhamma Duta from Thailand still help Indonesia to, to revive Buddhism. Yeah. This is a good opportunity uh, for Buddhist Indonesia. Yeah, every student must choose uh, one religion. So uh, we need to prepare young generation to become a Buddhist teacher for all in Indonesia. Yeah. Okay, and this is also another good story. Yeah, have to prepare a Buddhist uh, teacher. This is a Buddhist coin in Indonesia. There are 13 Buddhist coins to prepare young generation to become a Buddhist teacher. Nada for the first time, 1979, and then Smartunga, Kataja, Sarenda, Adenjaya, Suijaya, Dutawila, Maitreya, Buddhist coins, Buddhist Dharma, Buddhist coins, Samata Brada. 13 Buddhist coins in Indonesia have uh, to produce young generation to become a Buddhist teacher, to teach in school, elementary school, junior high school, senior high school, and also in university. Some of them have a uh, master degree also uh, for Buddhist education. Uh, Buddhist education. Uh, also, we have in Indonesia PKPB, that is a uh, organization for the Buddhist school. Uh, maybe about uh, 80 more Buddhist, Buddhist uh, school in Indonesia. I have been there, this there, like the Tilakna, Dhamma, Sohana, Mokorana, Sina Dhamma, Sekuto, Suya Dhamma, Sarangamita, Amitayus, and also Nanda. This is, I have been taught there. Yeah, terima kasih Sal Alton, thanks for attention. That is Buddhism in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Dr. Chef, for the informative presentation on 
with them in Indonesia. And uh, Dr. Don has a long experience in teaching uh, Buddhism in Indonesia. And according to the presentation, uh, Buddhism uh, flourished in Indonesia in the 7th and 8th century and disappeared from Indonesia in the 14th century. And uh, in the 16th century, uh, Islam uh, replaced uh, Hinduism. And in 1995, the Buddhism started to make a comeback uh, to Indonesia. And now, Indonesia has certain uh, Buddhist colleges. So, uh, thank you so much. And uh, for the specific time, you have uh, I congratulate you, Dr. Love, for the giving such an informative, uh, such uh, good information regarding Buddhism in Indonesia. And uh, you have, uh, Dr. Love has covered the entire history of uh, Buddhism in Indonesia from 7th century onwards to the present day also. And he uh, has uh, stressed the fact that during the three Vidya dynasty, from 7th to 14th century, there was much development of Buddhism there. And interesting information about Dharma Park, Shakti Kirti, and the famous Dharma Kirti has been given by him. And Sandy Mandur and Borobudur, which were important centers. And uh, uh, recently, Dr. Lokesh Chandra has done a lot of work on the two temples. And he has uh, given a very new theory that the Thakat Tattu Sangrai work, uh, the wonder is on, on this work, according to it, uh, the architecture has been based, that is really has propounded. But uh, you have also uh, propounded the theory that uh, 16th century there was a downfall. And then again it was revived by the Theravada Buddhism, and now it is going very strong there. And of course, I am glad to hear that there are so many good educational, Buddhist educational centers there, and you are working there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And for uh, my uh, Cambodian husband, uh, Dr. Kathy Mark, Dr. Don, as I think of the JP Purnasana University, I come here for the Satra and come here in the Purnasana University. I come out and look at some of the people in Biden, the Purnasana and Kathy Mark, Dr. Nordi, I have been a person who has been a person who has been a person who has been a ศาสนาในปุตตะตามาเนี่ยจ๊ะศาสนาที่ตอบมวยศาสนาอิสลามมีจำนวนศาสนาในฮินดูเอ่อศาสนาในฮินดูเอ่อชนะมวลบุญบ
uh, Christian, Sikh, and other non-religion, uh, they are uh, composing 1%. So, um, but Bangladesh was a Buddhist country for 400 years, from 8th century to the 12th century. From 8th century to 12th century, Bangladesh was a Buddhist country and was ruled by Pala dynasty, Pala kingdoms. So, after that, when Buddhism came under aggression from external forces, and also internally some oppression, then Buddhism is wiped away from Bangladesh, and um, it took nearly more than um, 700 years that revival of Buddhism has started now, now practicing Buddhism. Um, so, these are the rules uh, found in Bangladesh. I will be coming to this point later on. Bangladesh is a land of ancient Buddhist heritages. It was a Buddhist country, as I told, during the Pala dynasty from 750 to 1165 AD. As Pala kings were all Buddhists, it was quite natural that Buddhist monasteries and institutions that developed. As such, Bangladesh has been a gateway to the Buddhism tourism circuit for the Buddhists of the Indian subcontinent as well as for the Buddhist of Southeast Asian countries. The Buddha was a preacher of Buddhism. Historically, it is said that Buddhist Buddha visited Pundravadan, a northern part of Bangladesh, at the invitation of a pious devotee, Shumagada, who was the daughter of Anato Pindika Sreshti of Magadha. Sources of information are Tibbavadan, Avadhanaka Pogata of Kashmiri poet and historian Acharya Khamendra. Two disciples of Buddha were also from the then Banga, named as Bangisha and Banga Buddha. This shows that Buddhism was preached in Banga or Bengal during the time of Lord Buddha. The stupa at Basu Bihara campus near Mahastangar and Dhammaradika stupa at Savara, Dhaka, Bangladesh, erected by Emperor Asoka proved that Buddha visited Bangladesh. Chinese travelers, Fa Hien, Yuan Chang, and other Chinese uh, travelers also authenticated it in their travel accounts. According to a myth, the Buddha visited Chakrasara or Chattogram, Diden Chittagam, Bangladesh, and uh, Moinamuthi at Kumila and other parts of Bangladesh by his supernatural powers. But the very fact is that Buddhism gained its foothold in Bangladesh during the time of Emperor Ashoka, 273 to 232 BC. Since then, subsequent Buddhist kings and rulers patronized Buddhism. But after 1165 AD, one can say that Buddhism was rather totally wiped out and monasteries and institutions were mercilessly destroyed and devastated and Buddhism went beneath the soil of Hindi subcontinent. British rulers, especially archaeologists of Cunningham, started excavations and gradually ruins, remains of the monasteries and institutions started coming out of the soil. We are calling these remains or ruins as our heritage or Buddhist heritage. But the destroyers could not destroy the real Buddhist heritage, Buddha's wisdom. Buddha's wisdom is now being practiced by thousands of Buddhists in Bangladesh and millions and millions throughout the world. First of all, it must be mentioned here that one must have clear idea of the temple. I am not telling about this thing. Uh, the Rules which we have found in Bangladesh now, Syria I told you in different district, Sitakot Bihara Monastery of Dinaspur district, Diwali Bihara Monastery of Dinaspur district, Bachu Bihara Monastery of Akra district, 
পাহাড় পোড়া সোম পোড়া মহান বিহারা গ্রেট মনিস্টারি অফ নওগাঁ ডিস্ট্রিক্ট হলুদ বিহার অফ মনিস্টারি অফ নওগাঁ ডিস্ট্রিক্ট জগতদল বিহার অফ নওগাঁ ডিস্ট্রিক্ট ইট ইজ মোস্টলি ইন নর্থার্ন পার্ট অফ বাংলাদেশ and uh, there are a lot of monasteries and um, in um, samutaka or this uh, plain area the anand vihara sharban vihara bodh vihara these all the monasteries have gone under beneath the soil after the uh, aggression and you say there is one pandit vihara monastery in chitagong it means uh, chattogram in my district uh it was the university where all these people went there for a study and uh, also there are chakrasala bihar of patia who has said that shoma and uttara of uh, uh, and the emissary sent by emperor asoka they uh, took certain time to halt there in the chakrasala bihar monastery patia and also bikrampuri monastery ragunampur now the very near the back place of patish dipankar sri gyan who has spread buddhism in tibet his back place in bikrampur uh, um, uh, under the munshigans now district and there are now excavations going on two monasteries have been excavated one is ragunampur another is noteshwar buddhist monastery very near the back place of padrajogoni of patish dipankar sri gyan the great saint and scholar of bangladesh and there are also other uh, excavations going on in monstangor and um, also um, very recently there are developed many monasteries here uh, in bangladesh there are now more than 1000 buddhist monasteries now in bangladesh i am uh, showing you some uh, uh, sites of the pashu bihar this is the place where yuan chen went there and um, he saw the um, uh, theravada and mahayana monks they are uh, practicing buddhism in this uh, area and uh, in this path we had uh, the buddha stayed for 3 months this is bihar ghat another excavation in bangladesh uh, still uh, going on but uh, there are a lot of problems for the local people um this is very difficult to excavate uh, the big area na chita ko bihar this is another excavation going on but uh, very slowly this is monstanga where um, the um, spread of buddhism uh, there there is a uh, once upon a time capital of palo dynasty here yeah, monstanga this is another halut bihar Uh, where the monks were staying at Theravada time in a Mahajana monks, uh, all the monks were staying at that time there. This is Jagatdal Bihar. This is a very important Bihar at that time. Uh, no, this is um, uh, this is one of the most important. This is Shampuri Maha Bihar. It was said to be uh, the university and. Um, Uh, Lord Canning, um, Sir Cunningham started excavating this. This is existing government has taken lot of steps. Now it is the UNESCO project. Now there it is. Paharpur we have some of the scenes of Paharpur. This is a uh, lot of Hindus and uh, deities and other things are also on the engagement in the wall. Ah, uh, yes, sir. This is the well where water will be taken from here, and the monk, the monk is going on. And I visited a few months ago, Pahasun. So this is another monastery in my my Namuti in Tumila, uh, where the Buddha is supposed to go there and uh, do his supernatural power. And this is another big monastery in. Uh, This is Salgoli Bihar, another monastery in Kumila district. Now, uh, three to four years back, near the back place of Patish Dipankar Sri Gyan, this uh, uh, monastery is being excavated. 
Uh, and now it is under excavation. You see that some of the stupas are here and monastery area that, that, that the local people do not allow to excavate more. It is very, very, very big area in Ashtashri and Bajra Jukiri. This is another uh, near uh, Dhaka, Sabat, uh, Wari Potashar Monastery. This is also excavation going on in Bangladesh. And this is very recent uh, Mohamuni Monastery, uh, where uh, one uh, monk from Bangladesh went to Myanmar and brought a, a sketch of Mohamuni temple and uh, he uh, made it here in uh, in Chilabang. This is uh, this is the place where uh, it is told that Shoma and Uttara uh, take the time to step over here while going to Suvarnabhumi in Myanmar. From Chittagong to Myanmar is very near. So Soma and Uttara is said to stay here for one or two days, I think, and uh, they, uh, they are destroyed like this. This is Chakra Shavadiha. Ah, this is Tagapuni, another monastery with uh, very much renowned. And uh, many other sites of, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm just telling a few minutes about the birthplace of Atis Dipanka Sri Gyan. You know the Atis Dipanka Sri Gyan is a uh, great saint and scholar who has spread Buddhism and who has studied in Indonesia. Uh, uh, his teacher was a Thamakisti, was a teacher for 14 years with his disciple, he has studied in Indonesia. So he went to um, Tibet for uh, preaching Buddhism. Our uh, predecessor, who is the founder of our organization, Mahasanganay, Vishuddhananda Mahataro, in the year 1952, he found the place of Adhishtipanka Sri Gyan, Bath Place, in Bhadra Jukin. In the year 1963, a three-member delegation went to China, People's Republic of China, and then Premier Chow Wen Lai has given a portion of ash relics, or this Dipanka ash relics, to our organization. This ash relics is still preserved in the Dhammarajika Buddhist Monastery in Dhaka. Uh, Premier Chow Wen Lai is given 1978. We got the ash. Holy ash relics of Atish Tipanka to Bangladesh. Since then it is preserved in Dhammarajika Buddhist Mahavihara at the capital city of Dhaka, Bangladesh, with due sanctity and with due care. I invite all of you to visit Dhammarajika Buddhist Mahavihara in Bangladesh and see the ash relics of Atisha. Now, in the year 1983, you organized an international Buddhist conference in Bangladesh, and uh, actually it was a very successful conference. And uh, you know that Otis wrote many books, more than 35 books of esoteric religion and also philosophy, 80 books. This is the Otis Memorial, which you have built up very, very uh, three to four years ago, and you still are continuing with the work. And uh, it, is, it is actually known as the Nastiker Vita. Who, uh, who does not believe in God or Creator, so in this big room for 10th century. The history of Adisha. So, uh, Bangladesh, both the Krishna procession were under this leadership. Sanganayaka Suddhananda Mohatero, we are trying to establish the memorial complex of Adisha and uh, also a uh, lot of uh, followers, uh, including from Taiwan and also Chinese and Dalarama also, they are going to Bangladesh to visit Atisha Park Place. So, these are the... Uh, just uh, one minute, uh, we are going to the Golden Jati in Mandarban. This is, this is newly built in Jati, but this is just like Swagagun Pagara in uh, Myanmar. One Mount of Usala Mahatero is doing this, and uh, also this Rama Jati also. Thousands and thousands of people visit this Rama Jati in uh, this Golden. So this is the oldest jati of the king of, uh, uh, of the Chittagam Hilters, Mr. Devasi Shai, uh, very near Jinmar Joye jati. Uh, 
साउथ एशिया हार्टलैंड बुडिज्म सर्किट नेटवर्क बाय बांग्लादेश भूटान इंडिया नेपाल वेरी रिसेंटली आवर गवर्नमेंट ऑर्गेनाइज द टूरिज्म सर्किट कॉन्फ्रेंस आई हैड अपॉर्चुनिटी टू सेव यू अवर्स ऑन दिस सर्किट आल्सो सो दीज आर द रेफरेंसेस आई हैव टेकन थैंक्स यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर गिविंग मी टाइम दैट यू हैव हार्ड समथिंग अबाउट बुडिज हेरिटेज सर्किट थैंक यू वेरी मच Thank you very much, Professor Ibrahim, for your very interesting presentation. And uh, you have made a lot of research, with beautiful uh, picture, and uh, a lot of excavation. <coughs> and uh, through your presentation, we know that the Bangladesh is a land of ancient Buddhist uh, heritage. Yeah. And uh, during the, the reign of Emperor Soka, uh, Buddhism uh, was spread to Bangladesh. And in the even uh, 65 years, the appearance, uh, disappearance, disappearance of uh, Buddhism from uh, Bangladesh. And, uh, you have uh, many uh, we hear uh, what is a uh, monastery in Bangladesh I'm very much impressed uh, with uh, the golden shabi it is something like the uh, silver god in uh, Jambu the golden uh, shabi in Jambu yeah. very, very interesting, thank you so much and my good chair Thank you, Prof. Barwa, for such an interesting, very interesting presentation. And uh, what I liked was that we have been uh, reading and teaching about the Purusha Bhajan Bhakti uh, according to its inscription of the Gupta period, but you have brought out a very new fact that it was uh, Buddha himself visited that, and Sumagata was the daughter of Anath Pandit who had invited him. It's a very, I mean,